Good morning. Good to see everybody this morning, Palm Sunday. If you're a visitor here with, with us this morning, we want to welcome you. We are so glad that you have chosen to fellowship with us this morning. We are currently working our way through the book of Mark. So if you want to turn there, our passage this morning is in Mark chapter 3. <clears throat> and our passage will be Mark 3, verses 20 through 30. Let's go ahead and read that together. <clears throat> Mark 3.20, speaking of Jesus, <clears throat> then he went home, and the crowd gathered again so they could not even eat. And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him, for they were, for they were saying, he is out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying, he is possessed by Beelzebub, and by the prince of demons he casts out the demons. And he called them to him, and he said to them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but is coming to an end. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man then indeed he may plunder his house. Truly I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the children of men and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they were saying, he has an unclean spirit. Well, that shouldn't be too hard to understand. <laughs> Actually, this is one of the most confusing and disputed passages in the New Testament for the last 2,000 years. Um, I doubt that there's another passage in the New Testament that has caused more people to fret and fear lest they have committed this sin. I've been in public ministry for over 40 years, and I would doubt that there's been a year that's gone by that at least one person didn't ask me about this passage because they were afraid they had committed this sin. In my ministry here at, at MVCS, I have to say that probably two or three times a year, students ask me this question. People are worried about it, and that's good. This is a warning of God. It is a very stern warning of God, and all the warnings of God should be taken seriously. What a terrible prospect that a person could commit a sin that would make it impossible for that person to ever be forgiven. That should make us squirm a little bit. When we look at the magnitude of God's grace, the breadth and length and height and depth of the love and the grace of God, grace so vast that it extended all the way even to the people who crucified Jesus. Think about it. Jesus was hanging on the cross that day and he said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. Now, he would not have prayed that if the forgiveness was not possible for them because John says in 1 John, there is a sin unto death, and I don't tell you, you should pray for that. The writer of Hebrews says that people who've been enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift but have spurned it, there is no longer any repentance for people like that. Wow, to think of that, that it is possible that there is a sin that is greater than all the grace of God. What is that? I think it would be important for us to know. Maybe you are one of those people who has questioned whether you have committed the unforgivable sin. Well, it was important enough to God to put it in the Bible three times. We find this story, this passage, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Let's go ahead and pray and ask God for understanding because we're going to need it. Lord, we, we recognize that your word is here for a reason and you don't give us warnings flippantly. That if this warning is here, it's because it's real. 
and the prospect of committing this sin is real. You have promised to guide us into all truth, and we want to stand on that promise this morning. And so we pray in the authority and the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, let's start in verse 20. It says there, Then he went home, speaking of Jesus, and the crowd gathered again so that they couldn't even eat. And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him. The family went out to seize him, for they were saying, the family was saying, he is out of his mind. So Jesus goes back home. Presumably we're talking about the same home that we're talking about in Mark 1, the, the Peter's house in Capernaum. And once again, just like we've seen in the first three chapters of Mark, the crowds descend on Jesus in that home, so much so that Jesus and his disciples couldn't even find a moment to get a bite to eat. Jesus is teaching. He's healing. He's casting out demons. The house is full. The house is surrounding. There is this almost riotous situation around the house. Everybody trying to get to the healer. There is complete mayhem. Jesus' family hears about it down in, or up in Nazareth in Judea, and they leave and they go to Jesus all the way from Nazareth. They've heard about the craziness, all this circus that's surrounding Jesus, and they make the trek 40 miles, probably a three-day trip, especially with Mary along. And what are they there for? A family intervention to get Jesus to get him and to bring him home because they were convinced he'd lost his mind. And yes, please notice, that includes Mary. Look at verse 31. We didn't read it, but look at verse 31. Jeff will be treating this in two weeks. It says, And his mother and brothers came, and standing outside the house, they sent to him and called him. His mother and brothers. And we actually have the names of his brothers in Mark chapter 6, verse 3. It says, is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and Jude and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us, sisters? So he had at least two sisters. So he has at least four brothers and two sisters with himself. That makes seven children that Mary had, that Mary bore, seven children. And then here in Mark 3.21, we're told that Mary and some of the brothers have decided that Jesus was, had lost it and needs a family intervention. So they show up. Well, first of all, let me just point out that this completely flies in the face of the Catholic, the Roman Catholic idea that Mary was perfect and sinless and was, in fact, a perpetual virgin. She was not. She was a virgin when she conceived Jesus, but after Jesus was born, her and Joseph consummated that marriage. They had a normal marriage and many children. But even as they, those children grew up with Jesus, they didn't trust him, that he was the Messiah. And Mary herself, by this time, was having doubts. So please don't try to make Mary into a superhero. She was an amazing woman. And she deserves our respect. And she knew some truth about it. If you remember, in Luke chapter 1, the angel comes to, G to a Mary and she says to her, you will conceive and bear a son and you shall name him Jesus and he will be great and will be called the son of the most high and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and his kingdom will have no end. That was the promise of God and Mary believed and said, okay, be it done unto me as you, as you have said. But now Mary seems to be having some doubts. Jesus isn't quite fitting into what she had expected, what he would look like, a king sitting on the throne of David. <laughs> At this point in his ministry, Jesus is homeless in the backwaters of Galilee, hanging out with a bunch of Galilean hillbilly fishermen and, and tax collectors and a zealot. And he's frequently stirring up a beehive at the temple with the leaders of the Jewish nation, and, and he's not even taking care of himself. He's not even eating right, which would give any good Jewish mother cause for concern. <laughs> now, if you have a problem believing that even Mary doubted Jesus, what about John the Baptist? He had his doubts. Right in Matthew 11, John had been in prison by that time for more than a year. 
And he was beginning to wonder, is this homeless cousin of mine really the one who is going to come, the Lamb of God who is going to take away the sins of the world? So John himself, John the Baptist, who proclaimed Jesus to be the Lamb of God, says to his disciples, go find Jesus and ask him, are you the one or should we expect somebody else? Because John himself was having doubts. So both John and Mary had their doubts at times. But rather than discourage us, I think the doubts of these people who were so close to Jesus, his closest allies, that they doubted should encourage us, right? I don't know about you, but I think we all have doubts at times. Very rarely does God work the way we think he should work, right? He doesn't do things according to our counsel. I hope you can just get used to that idea. He doesn't take advice from us, and he doesn't try to fit into our pattern of the way things should work out in our lives or in this world. His ways are so much higher than our ways, and his thoughts so much higher than our thoughts, that we are guaranteed going to be frequently perplexed by the way God decides to do things. It's okay. That's why we're told to trust him. By faith, not by sight. Because very frequently, this, if you're looking at the situation with human eyes from a human perspective, it's not going to look like God's involved. So, like many of the Jews, John and Mary and Jesus' siblings were looking for a political, military Messiah who would come and wrestle Rome to the ground and elevate Israel back as a world power the way David and Solomon did, and restore the nation of Israel to its former glory. But instead of a mighty king with his mighty men, Jesus had a different plan. He decided he was going to use common people, born-again sinners and tax collectors, to spread his invisible internal kingdom in Israel and to the ends of the earth. I have no doubt that Mary was confused. She had such high expectations of this promised, miraculous son who was given to her, who would th sit on the throne of David and rule over the kingdom of Israel. And yet here he was, wasting his time, wasting his potential, with a bunch of cast castaways, and she couldn't reconcile the idea. And worse, she was stirring up the rulers, the Jewish rulers, against himself with a band of misfits up in Galilee. So I think it's very possible that Mary just decided, you know what, I'm going to go straighten this out. My son is confused. He's supposed to be the king, so I'm going to do God a favor, and I'm going to go up, and I'm going to straighten out my son and get him back on track. Now, if Mary thought she had problems with Jesus, the Pharisees had bigger problems with Jesus. Jesus' fame as a healer and as a teacher was spreading, not just up there in the backwaters of Galilee, but even down in Judea and in Jerusalem itself. And the crowds were starting to believe that Jesus was in fact the Messiah. Turn with me to Mark, or excuse me, Matthew chapter 12. Keep your finger in Mark 3, and we're going to keep bouncing back and forth between Matthew 12 and Mark 3. It's the same event in Matthew 12, but Matthew adds some important details. Matthew 12, verse 22, tells us the immediate circumstance of the Pharisee's accusation. Matthew 12, 22, then a demon-oppressed man who was blind and mute was brought to him, and Jesus healed him, so the man spoke and saw. And all the people were amazed and said, can this be the son of David? The crowds were becoming convinced that Jesus was in fact the Messiah. Verse 24 in Matthew 12. But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, it is only by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, that he casts out demons. Knowing their thoughts, Jesus said to them, every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and no city or house divided against itself will stand. And if Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? And if I cast out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. 
Verse 28, get this. But if it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. That has been Jesus' message in Mark. The kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God is upon you. Verse 29. Or how can someone enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man? Then indeed he may plunder his house. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. Verse 31. Therefore, I tell you, every sin and every blasphemy will be forgiven people, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. And whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven in this age or in the age to come. Matthew tells us that they were all amazed. Everyone was amazed, well, except the Pharisees. The Pharisees, they were threatened. What if these people really did become convinced that this guy, this carpenter, was the Messiah, and they went after him? And all the crowds went after Jesus. What would happen to the Pharisees and their power and their position and their prestige? Notice back in Mark chapter 3, verse 22. It says these Pharisees had come down from Jerusalem because Jerusalem is in the hill country, so it's at a higher elevation. So even though, even though Galilee is to the north, they went down from Jerusalem because they were going down in elevation. And just like Jesus' family, these guys were concerned about all of the hubbub around Jesus and all this commotion. And they came, just like the family, to straighten him out. Verse 22 in Mark 3 says, And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying, He is possessed by Beelzebul, and by the prince of demons he casts out demons. Notice the tense of the verb. They were saying. This isn't a one-time accusation. They were passing around this idea. So as people went to Jesus, and they were taught by Jesus, and maybe healed by Jesus, and left, the Pharisees were out and mixing in the crowd, trying to convince the people of something else. They were spreading this narrative that, okay, yeah, he's doing some great things, but he's doing them by the power of the devil, not by the power of God. See, the Pharisees could no longer deny that Jesus had supernatural power, a, a ploy they tried early on, but now it was apparent to everybody that Jesus had this supernatural power, and so they tried to a, a, attribute his miraculous power to the work of Satan, Beelzebul, the Lord of the Flies, the Prince of Demons. Now, I have to say, I am not convinced that these guys actually believe their own story. They were simply trying to stem the tide of the popularity that was sweeping the nation for Jesus. Turn with me to John chapter 3. Keep your finger in Mark 3 and turn over to John 3. Okay, so now you've got a finger in Mark 3, Matthew 12, and John 3. Sorry. In John chapter 3, we have the encounter with Jesus and Nicodemus. Nicodemus came to Jesus at night. This wasn't an official visit. He was afraid of being seen. But he came to Jesus at night. And he confides in Jesus in verse 2. Look at verse 2. John 3, verse 2. Nicodemus says, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. For no one can do the things that you are doing unless God is with him. Now remember, in this exchange, in John chapter 3, Jesus calls Nicodemus the teacher of Israel. Apparently, Nicodemus was a, a teacher of the teachers of Israel. He was probably the top guy of the scribes in Jerusalem. And Jesus chides him at one point for being that guy and not being under, able to understand that he was the Messiah. But Nicodemus admits here in verse 2, we know that you are from God. Who's the we there? We scribes, the scribes of the Pharisees. We know that you are from God. Now, I, could, I suppose that you could say that Nicodemus was being disingenuous here and he was trying to trap Jesus like a lot of the Pharisees did throughout Jesus' ministry. But the whole of Nicodemus' life really doesn't bear that out. The way Jesus interacts with Nicodemus in chapter 3, he doesn't treat Nicodemus like the other Pharisees who came to trap him. Jesus actually gives Nicodemus the way of salvation. 
And then at the end of the story in chapter 19 of John, Nicodemus goes with jo Joseph of Arimathea and asks for the body to prepare Jesus' body for burial. It's pretty clear Nicodemus was a believer by that point. And even back in chapter 3 of John, Nicodemus makes it very clear that the Sanhedrin at that time knew that Jesus' miracles and teaching were from God. So again, the claim that the scribes and the Pharisees are making here in Mark 3, if you want to turn back there, is actually coming from jealousy and selfish ambition. They're trying to turn the crowds away from Jesus because they're losing their grip on the crowds. And so they're doing that by trying to attribute Jesus' power, the Holy Spirit's power in Jesus, to Satan. But in Matthew 12, 28, we saw Jesus said, it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, by the Spirit of God. Jesus, by the Spirit of the, of, of the living God, is confronting the forces of evil throughout Israel, but the Pharisees are spreading a story that he's doing it by Satan's power, that he's in league with Satan. And it's just a dumb argument, and Jesus exposes why it's a dumb argument. Look at verse 23 again in chapter 3 of Mark. And he called them to him, and he said to them in parables, how can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but is coming to an end. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man, then indeed he may plunder his house. So Jesus points out the weakness of their story, of their narrative, using two parables. First, he uses the parable of the divided kingdom, the divided house, and then he tells the parable of binding the strong man. So to the first parable, Jesus states the obvious. Any house, any organization, any family, any nation, any church, any group divided against itself will not be able to stand. Take note, parents. Take note, Christians. Take note, Americans. It's axiomatic. When division creeps in, the fall of that house is just around the corner. There is no way that Satan would do what Jesus is doing to Satan at this point. You cannot attribute Jesus' acts in the spiritual realm to Satan because there's no way Satan would do that. Now, to the second parable, you can't go into a strong man's house and rob him of his belongings unless you first tie him up. I think that's really interesting. First of all, Jesus goes ahead and admits that Satan is a strong man. Don't underestimate Satan. And second, Jesus admits that this world is his house. This world is his domain. Satan is the prince of the power of the air, Ephesians 2. 2 Corinthians 4 says that, Je uh, that um, Satan is the god of this world. But Jesus also makes it clear that the kingdom of God is at hand. That he came to establish his kingdom. His, not, not a physical kingdom, not a visible kingdom that you could see, but this invisible kingdom internal, eternal rule in this world. It will be visible someday. Not now. Even 2,000 years later, it's not visible. But Jesus was there establishing his kingdom person by person by person by person. Satan wasn't bound in this world at the moment that Jesus came into the world. But Satan was binding him individually in people's lives and releasing the captives. Now, we will get to see that binding of Satan. You can read about it in Revelation 20 this afternoon if you want. But right now, today, it's person by person, house by house, and it's continuing. Then in verse 28 of Mark 3, Jesus says, I think one of the most terrifying things that he ever said now, I'm going to read this again, and I'm going to read it in Mark 3, beginning in verse 28, and then right after that, I'm going to read it again in Mark 12, verse 31, so we can compare those two passages. I want you to read them along with me. Mark 3, 28, and then Matthew 12, 31. Mark 3, 28. Truly, 
I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the children of man and, what, and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they were saying he has an unclean spirit. Now, Matthew 12. Notice the additional details Matthew gives us. Matthew 12, 31. Therefore I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven people. Every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven people. Notice the scope of the grace of God. But the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. And whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. That's terrifying. Absolutely terrifying. That a person could commit a sin that would make it impossible for that person to ever be saved. In this life or in the life to come. To think that that kind of sin is a possibility. That that kind of sin would actually be outside the reach of the grace of God. Have you ever wondered if you've committed the unforgivable sin? Well, what is it? That's a question, isn't it? It has to be bad. Right? Jesus said you could blaspheme him and be forgiven. Right? You could even take Jesus' life. You could nail Jesus to the cross. And while he's on the cross, he would pray for you, saying, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Meaning that forgiveness would still be possible for you. But to blaspheme the Spirit is unpardonable. It's unforgivable. Okay, well, first of all, let's clarify our terms. What is blasphemy? Well, Jesus helps us out with that in, Mark, in, excuse me, in Matthew 12, in verse 32 of Matthew 12. In verse 31, Jesus said, the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. And then in the very next verse, in verse 32 of, of Matthew 12, he says, whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. So blasphemy includes or involves speaking against God. It is a sin, apparently, that we commit with our words. Whether spoken words or written words, it is blasphemy against the holy, perfect character of God. It can be an insult aimed at God, mocking God, dishonoring God, slandering God. Somebody said, blasphemy is the opposite of praise. It can even be as casual as just the name of God slipping out of your mouth in a manner that does not give God his proper place and his proper honor. For instance, saying, oh my God, when you're surprised. That is blasphemy against God. Praise God, though. That is not the unpardonable sin, because Jesus says right here in Mark 3, 28, all sins will be forgiven the children of men, and whatever blasphemies they utter. Blasphemy against the name of God is serious, but it is clearly not the unforgivable sin, because if it were, there would be no hope for any of us. I'm not sure anybody in this room has been able to guard your mouth to that point. But it's blasphemy against the Holy Spirit that will never be forgiven. So what is that? Well, the context of our passage shows that the scribes were accusing Jesus of doing miracles, of healing people and casting out demons by the power of the devil, when in fact he was doing it in the power of the Holy Spirit. So they were calling the Holy Spirit an unclean spirit. You see that in verse 30 of Mark 3. The Pharisees had just witnessed Jesus cure a deaf, mute demoniac. They saw the clear demonstration of God's power right before their eyes. Not just this day, but many days. And Jesus tells us that this was the power of the Spirit. But the Pharisees willfully reject that, and they reject Jesus' authority to do these things in God's power. Here's the thing. We know these guys deep down really really did not believe that this was Satan's power. 
Nicodemus admitted that they knew it was the power of God in John 2. No. This was willful disobedience against what they knew to be true. But because of their pride and because of their jealousy, they could not bring themselves to the point of honoring Jesus with the honor that he deserves. This is the sin of Satan. This is what Satan did. This is what Lucifer did. From the time Lucifer was created until he was finally kicked out of heaven, Lucifer did all things well. He was one of the most beautiful angels. But at some point, he decided he could no longer honor God as, as God. He wanted to be God. He wanted to be honored like God was being honored. And so he tried to take that place, and God said, no, you're done. Now, Satan didn't believe in God. Satan knew God. The unforgivable sin is not the sin of unbelief. Quite the opposite. Lucifer knew God, and he rejected him as God. He refused to honor him as God. And that's the sin of the Pharisees that we see in our passage today. Knowing the truth about where Jesus got his power to do these miracles, they were spreading lies behind his back saying he did it by Satan. They knew his power was from God. But pride and jealousy, think Lucifer, pride and jealousy would not allow them to honor him. So in willful disobedience, they spread lies in the crowd to those who would otherwise have honored Jesus. Now I know, I know a lot of commentators, if you look this up in the commentaries, a lot of commentators will tell you that the, the unpardonable sin is simply to not believe in Jesus and then persist in that unbelief until you die. But at any moment from the time you decided not to believe until you died, you could change your mind and get saved. The problem with that explanation is that what Jesus says here in, Mark, in Matthew 12, 32, whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven in this age, in this life, or in the afterlife. Jesus makes it very clear that this is a sin that you can commit while on earth, before you die, and after you commit it, never be able to be forgiven again. It's frightening that he can't, he won't forgive you for the rest of your life and then into eternity. Now, it's, it's found in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It's, it's, this is serious business. Okay, so the person who commits this sin has a clear understanding of who Jesus is and what power is actually at work in him but they willfully reject the facts about Jesus and about his, his power, and they slanderously attribute his power to the working of Satan. Remember Jesus, when he confronts demons, the demons almost always know him and identify in him, even proclaim the truth about who he is. But they refuse, in their pride and in their jealousy, they refuse to honor him for who he is. And people who do this, not talking about the demons now, people who do this cannot be forgiven because they actually do see the truth and they know the truth. Why do they know the truth? How do they know the truth? Because it was the Holy Spirit who revealed that truth to them. But they deny and they mock and they slander that truth. This is real. Please understand. I know we like to say and we like to believe that, the, that there is no sin that is beyond the reach of God's grace. But Jesus makes it clear to us in this passage this morning that there is an exception. That it is possible to put oneself outside the reach of God's grace and still be alive on earth. Let me ask you this. What does the New Testament say about the ministry of the Holy Spirit as it pertains to the spread of the gospel on earth? Turn with me to John chapter 16. I think it's worth looking at this together. John chapter 16. John chapter 16 is still um, during the, the Last Supper. Um, in John chapter 16, Jesus obviously is speaking on the eve of his crucifixion. He's telling his disciples, I'm leaving. It's okay, though. I'm going to send somebody in my stead. 
and it'll be good for you. But they were sad. So in John 16, verse 6, Jesus says, But because I've said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness because I go to the Father and you will no longer see me. And concerning judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. It is the Spirit's job to convict the world, to convict unbelievers of sin and righteousness and judgment. It is only by the Spirit that you or I can see the truth of the gospel. It is only by the Spirit that we can have the veil removed so we can see truth clearly. It is only by the Spirit that we can have faith in the gospel message that, it is, that is preached. And it is only by the Spirit that we can repent. It's the Spirit who removes the blinder. It is the Spirit who enlightens the eyes of our hearts to see the truth. But forgiveness is not available to those who see the truth. Forgiveness is only available to those who see the truth and repent. And it is the Holy Spirit who brings us to repentance. If we blaspheme the Father or we blaspheme the Son, we still have a chance that the Holy Spirit will convict us of our sin and bring us to repentance. Hmm. But if we reject the Spirit, after we've clearly seen the truth illuminated by Him, after clearly seeing the signs and the miracles that He performs even in our own lives, after clearly having our eyes enlightened to the truth, acknowledging that the power and the miracles that, that Jesus does by the power of the Spirit are from God and yet spurning them and attributing them to the devil, then we have placed ourselves beyond the reach of God's grace. It's a very special place. It doesn't happen that often. There are Satanists who do this. They know the truth about Jesus Christ. They're not going to bow. There are a lot of devil worshipers who know that Jesus is the Christ, just like the demons do. And in their spirits, their spirits agree with the demons that Jesus is God. But they'll be damned, excuse for my language, but it's the correct use of the word. They'll be damned if they will bow and honor him as God. That's the sin we're talking about here. Louis Burkhoff, in his commentary on this passage, says, This sin consists in the conscious, malicious, and willful reject rejection and slander against the evidence and conviction of the testimony of the Holy Spirit respecting the grace of God in Christ attributing it out of hatred and enmity to the prince of darkness. In committing that sin, man willfully, maliciously, and intentionally, intentionally attributes what is clearly recognized as the work of God to the influence and operation of the devil. See, the person who commits this sin can't be one to Christ because they know the truth, they've seen the signs, but they put themselves outside the reach of the Spirit. It's not that this sin is so great that the blood of Jesus can't pay for it. No, the blood of Jesus, the sacrifice of Christ, is greater than any sin. No, this person's heart has simply become so hard and their minds so dark that they have placed themselves willfully, by choice, outside the reach of God's grace. So, I'll ask you again, is it possible that you have committed the unforgivable sin? Well, if you're worried that you may have committed the unforgivable sin, then you clearly have not committed the unforgivable sin, right? I can tell you straight up, 100%. No way. No, it, it, no one who has blatantly rejected the Holy Spirit and attributed the Holy Spirit's work to an unclean spirit would be worried that they had committed this sin. The very fact that you're concerned that you may have committed this sin is proof positive that you haven't committed this sin. 
the, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit doesn't happen because some angry words or some neglected, neglectful words escape our lips in haste or in anger. No, the, the, the scripture is clear. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Is there a sin in your life that's weighing heavily on your soul so heavy that you think maybe that's the unforgivable sin? Well, do this. First of all, praise God. Praise God that it's weighing on your conscience, that your conscience is still sensitive enough to cause this sin to bother you. Second, recognize that no one who had committed the unforgivable sin would be bothered by their sin. And three, simply confess your sin to God and repent. Turn from it and turn to God. Seeking the goodness of God and the nurture of the Holy Spirit, the one who was sent as our comforter and our helper to hold us and to mold us and to make us to be the men and the women that he wants us to be. Jesus says right here in Mark 3, 28, all sins will be forgiven, people, and whatever blasphemies they utter, all you got to do is ask, and he'll forgive. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that if there is anybody here in this congregation this morning who is worried and concerned that they've committed this sin, Lord, that you would release them from that burden by the power of your spirit in their lives, Lord. Give them the grace and the ability to respond in repentance to the convicting work of the spirit and then to breathe in the pure air of grace that comes with the gospel and forgiveness. And I pray it in Jesus' name, amen.